so caught up so many times, some of us in the church world, we get so caught up in the church routine and we get comfortable with the routine because we can understand the routine. We can control the routine. We can manage the routine. This is what I'm, you got your whole day plan already. You've got it all figured out. But God sometimes steps into the moment of your routine and says, today is the day. Some people carry weight because of the actions that they've done. Some people carry a heavy weight because of what has been done to them. Right. Are you listening to me? The devil doesn't play fair. Right. Come on, That's right. Come on. You would think there'd be, oh, you mean he should let people go. No, the devil doesn't play fair. And she said, for 20-something years, I lived with this weight because of the abuse. And she goes, she'd been a Catholic her whole life, and I don't know if she said she practiced Catholic or what, but she had come to one of our uh, mobile markets. It was a, a Monday mobile market that we do for seniors. She said, I just came to get food. And she said, a couple of the gentlemen, and it was uh, Freedom and Josh, actually prayed for her. And she said, when they prayed for me, this weight lifted. And she said, when the weight lifted, she knew there was something different here. Come on, somebody. We don't have to argue people. Just let them know you love them. And see the weight that the devil's put on their life be lifted. And she started coming. She goes, the first time I came, she goes, she goes I thought to myself, this is different. She'd only gone to Catholic Church. I'm not bashing for or against. But she said, this is different. She goes, and then you, she goes, you start talking, and she goes, Later on, you start yelling, and it didn't even scare me. I said, well, I'm glad, because I really don't want to scare people. That's not the goal. But our lives can be the light that God wants to use, no matter who you are, no matter where you're at, to impact people's lives. So Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And on the cross, John chapter 19, if you're not there, just... Don't worry about it. Put your thumb in your, in your Bible like you, just act like you found it. If you haven't found it yet, just act like you did. Close it up, put your hand there, and people just assume you got it. We'll look to the screen. Gospel, Gospel of John chapter 19, verse 30, the latter part. Jesus said, and this is while he's on the cross. It is finished. Say, it is finished. It is finished. Come on, shout, it is finished. It is finished. And he, bowing his head, he yielded up the spirit, which means he died. Right before he died, he, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Now let me read another verse, and you don't have to read along, but I just like this because of all the details. Each, each author of the Gospels give a little de different detail. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, says it this way. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he yielded up the Spirit. So we know that it, it is finished wasn't a whisper, it was a cry out. It was a loud roar. He yielded up his Spirit, and at that moment, I love this, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, I'm not going to go into that anytime today, but I want you to spend time and read it on your own and just think about it. That when Jesus said, it is finished, and cried out and died, people that were saints that had already died came out of the tomb walking around. Can you imagine what they were thinking? What are we doing here? I thought, talk about time change. Uh, they actually went into this city. I mean, some cool things were happening. A lot of important things here. But I want to draw attention back to the phrase. And what is the key phrase that we just referenced? It Say, it is finished. Come on, let me work you today. Say, it is finished. It is finished. Come on, one more time. Say, it is finished. It is finished. Oh, you guys are awesome. So glad to have you with us today. It is finished. Now, my question to you is, if I don't know what it is, how do I know it is finished? 
What's it? All I know, it's finished. Could that be dinner? What does that represent? So we have to go to the beginning of what the it is to find out what, when it's finished. It is finished. Oh, that means everything that Jesus needed to do was done. No, later on, he came in resurrected form and said, listen, at one time he was like, don't touch me. I still have to go to the Father and, and sprinkle my blood on the mercy seat of heaven. So he still had ministry. Oh, well, it was after that. It was all part. Well, wait a minute. The Bible says that he's at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us, even to this day. So he still had ministry to do. So what is the it? What is the that is finished? What is it is finished? To understand what is finished, we need to know what it was started. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 18. I promise I won't have you long today so you can get into the buffet. Because Easter buffets are the worst. You already put your reservation in. Some of you got the app going. You're putting in food right now so you can just do the pickup. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 18. Now, in the context, and please read the whole chapter in your own time, Jesus goes in basically what we call the church, the temple, and they hand him a scroll, and he begins reading. He, he opens up to this passage, which is really out of Isaiah, chapter 61. And Jesus reads this part of the passage. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is a prophecy Isaiah gave in Isaiah 61 that talks about the Messiah. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Here, here's a key phrase, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. To preach to the acceptable, what was the proclamation? The acceptable year of the Lord. Now let me pause there for a second and we'll come back because I want to read another verse. John chapter 3, verse 16. Have you heard this verse? The Amplified Translation, because I want to mess you up a little bit if you've known it from the King James part. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now we'll stop with that. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And we stop with that. But the next verse is very important to the context. Notice this next verse, verse 17. For God did not send the Son into the world, notice, to judge and condemn. Now there's a balance here, so stay with me. To judge and condemn the world, that is to initiate the final judgment of the world. But that the world might be saved through him. What is he saying? The assignment of Jesus when he came to the earth was not to bring judgment. Though judgment will come, it wasn't to come to judge people, it was come to save people. They understood in Judaism, Judaism, there is two different messiahs. Messiah means the anointed one, we call savior. There was two different uh, messiahs. There is Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David which means the Messiah after the lineage of David and one after Joseph. The first one in, in the Old Testament gives prophecies about both that seem to be in conflict. One talks about the Messiah coming through Bethlehem. Have you heard that story before? One shows the Messiah coming in the clouds. One Messiah, the Messiah of Joseph, refers to the Messiah coming as a suffering servant. One Messiah, the Messiah of David, shows the Messiah coming as the ruling king. Both Messiahs, still Jesus. So that's why when they would see Jesus, many times they were like, Messiah, son of David. They thought he, was the, he came as the Messiah to rule. That's why the disciples were like, where are we going to be in the rank and order of this? That's why when, when they were singing Hosanna and doing the palm branches and he's riding in, uh, they were like, is now the time to usher in the kingdom? Because they were looking at him as the Messiah. 
been David. They were looking at him as the Messiah that was coming to rule. But they didn't have revelation yet that before he came to rule and bring judgment, he was coming, come on church, he was coming to save. So he was the, he's literally the author and the finisher of this process. The author and finisher of our faith. So before he judges humanity, he comes to take their place and provide redemption for humanity that is later will be judged. That's why the Bible says judge, not, judge nothing before it's time. Because there is a time for judgment. And that's why you might say, well, if God is real, why does all this bad stuff still keep happening? Because the absence of God, just like the absence of light is darkness, the absence of God is evil, and the time for God's judgment on humanity is not yet. Right. We are still in the, in the phase on, of his mercy, yeah. the acceptable year of the Lord. Yeah. Do you see that? And so they were looking for him to rule as king, but to rule as king, he must subdue all his enemies under his feet. There must be judgment. It's not time yet. And we see that going back to that verse, uh, verse 19, of, uh, excuse me, of Luke's gospel chapter 4. He said, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, notice verse 20, and he closed the book. Now that carries a lot of emphasis. Why? Because when he closed the book, he stopped reading. So what's the point? Because if you go to Isaiah 61, after that phrase, it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and then it goes on to, and the vengeance and judgment of our God. He stopped before the judgment and closed the book and saying, it's not time for judgment yet. Because to bring, before you can bring judgment, I'm going to bring redemption. Oh my goodness, this is awesome. And so people are like, why isn't God judging yet? Because the season of judgment has not come. And guess who the judge is? Oh, God is. No, Jesus said that the Father has put all judgment into my hands. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Ooh, that could be a part of that last series, being the finisher. And he closed the book. And he gave it to the minister and sat down. Verse 20, continuing. Notice this. There's so much in the Word of God. Notice, he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister, and he did what? He sat down. We're going to throw this and keep it on the screen for a little bit. And he sat down. Say, he sat down. Sat now, you might think, what's the big deal? The next phrase says, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, looking at him. Why would they be looking at him? Oh, because what he read. No, that's just not it. They were looking at him because in the synagogue, there was always a chair that was left empty. And in that chair, it represented a seat, a position. Remember, we talked about making space for God. They, they, had, they were basically, as an example, they were making room for the Messiah. So every synagogue had a chair in it. No one sat in it because it was reserved for the Messiah. So when Jesus shut the book, he was saying, we're not going to get to judgment yet. We're staying in my job now. The season now is to declare the favor, the goodness, the love of God. And then he closed the book, handed it to the minister, and he sat down in the chair reserved for the Messiah. We just read that at glance and say, he sat down. What's the big deal? It is a very big deal. He was letting everybody in the synagogue know that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And I'm here to decree and declare the goodness of God. Before the, there is coming a season, season of judgment. But before that, it's a season of redemption. It's the mercy of God, the favor of God. He closed up the book and sat down in the seat of the Messiah. Notice, and it doesn't stop. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. So today is the day. Come on, shout, today is the day. See, they were so caught up in the routine of doing what they were supposed to do. They didn't understand it. Everything was symbolic. Pattern and shadows, the Old Testament says, of the New Testament. Patterns and shadows of Jesus coming. They didn't understand it. It all, if you go back even to the feast, represents a, a pattern. It is a rehearsal, like a dress rehearsal, all for something future. It, it connected to a historical event, had a practical event, but always pointed. Everything points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. And so they got so caught up. Listen 
listen to me. They got so caught up in the good routine that they were missing the God moment. This day, this day, we don't want it to be this day. We get so caught up so many times, some of us in the church world, we get so caught up in the church routine and we get comfortable with the routine because we can understand the routine. We can control the routine. We can manage the routine. This is what I'm, you got your whole day planned already. You've got it all figured out, but God sometimes steps into the moment of your routine and says, today is the day. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but in the moment.